All right, we can get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here today for the session, Be Bold, Take a Stand, Change the World. Today, we are really looking forward to speaking you, with you about how to move beyond focusing purely on systemic, uh, sorry, on individual action to focusing on systemic change. And we have some great speakers here to talk with you about that. So I'm gonna start with telling you a story and a lot of people don't know it. In the year 2000, BP, British Petroleum, hired a prominent PR campaign, PR firm called Ogilvy and & Mather. And in a $250 million effort, they um, created a campaign. The objective, to popularize the idea of the individual carbon footprint. Under a green veil, this was a strategy deliberately intended as a manipulative campaign to move the focus away from fossil fuel companies and onto us. BP's PR campaign to blame the crisis on everyday people and instead of focusing on fossil fuel companies had some success in changing the narrative. We started to focus on our own lives in the fight for social and climate justice. Now, is doing your part to live sustainably bad? Of course not. We always love it when folks are focusing on this and doing this. But making those changes aren't available to everyone, those who don't have the time, resources, and energy to make those changes in their own lives. To create real change, we know we need to go further, much further. This is just one example of how looking inward in the fight for social justice cannot be the only solution. Today's panel is about moving beyond ourselves, our companies, our operations, and using our platforms to focus on systemic change impacting society at large. Today, we're here to talk about how companies can use their platforms in new ways, activism and advocacy. Patagonia and Ben & Jerry's are landmark brands that have proven that social advocacy isn't just the right thing to do, it can be a recipe for building a successful company and changing the world. And one thing is, like I mentioned, we'd love to hear your questions, so feel free to submit those uh, in the panel on the right side, and we'll try to get to some. So I'm excited to introduce you to some of our speakers. Um, the first is Avi Garbo. Avi, if you want to come on. Avi is a nationally recognized environmental leader, lawyer, and advocate who currently serves as Patagonia's environmental advocate. Avi has a story tenure at the Environmental Protection Agency, serving as senior counselor during the Biden administration and as the Senate confirmed general counsel during the Obama administration, two administrations. He has been a key player in advancing several landmark federal efforts to address climate change and beyond. Jay Curley is the global head of integrated marketing for Ben & Jerry's, where he leads the development and execution of consumer marketing activities in the US and global advertising and communications. These integrated programs bring Ben & Jerry's progressive mission to life in traditional advertising, innovative social media and digital engagement, retail shops, social activism, and live consumer experiences, a lot of things. Jay has been the marketing lead for Ben & Jerry's on campaigns focused on climate justice, criminal justice reform, and voting rights. And last but not least, Chris Miller. Chris is the head of global activism strategy for Ben & Jerry's, where he spearheads consumer-facing activism campaigns that support the company's progressive mission and values. He previously worked on corporate consciousness and sustainability for Seventh Generation and as the climate campaign director for Greenpeace. Today, he serves as the vice chair of the board for the Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. And I am your moderator, Molly Kawahata, with a passion for climate justice and social justice, and I'm really looking forward to talking with these folks. So thank you all so much for being here. All right, so we're gonna start the panel by just focusing on one question for each um, panelists each, and then we'll jump into a live discussion. So Avi, I'd love to kick off the conversation by talking to you about what systemic change means. We know that climate change and social justice issues are structural problems that need to be addressed and demand solutions at scale. And you have a long history of working in the climate mitigation and policy space. As Patagonia's environmental advocate today, can you talk about the role policy and advocacy have in solving environmental and social crises and how Patagonia has succeeded in focusing in this space? 
Uh, sure, Molly. First of all, thank you, uh, and Chris and Jay. It's great to be with you all and others on the uh, on the call today. I, I thought it'd be helpful just to give a sense of kind of where we have come in our own Patagon Patagonia journey, just to kind of put in context where we are today when it comes to our policy and our advocacy. Um, you know, you go back about fifty years. Our founder, Ivan Schwinnard, um, was a surfer, a climber. Uh, even a falconer uh, back then. And, and I always like uh, kind of reminding folks, he, he was an early maker of, uh, of climbing equipment in the U.S. He started in a tin shed actually in Burbank, California. And I love the fact that one of his uh, earliest catalogs was, uh, I think, all of a page long and had the, um, the disclaimer not to expect fast delivery between May and November. So he clearly had his priorities right at the time. Um, but early on, uh, around 1970, the Schwinnard Equipment Company moved to Ventura in part because of the surf break up there, uh, but it became the largest supplier of climbing ha hardware in the U.S. But at the time, one of the main components of, of climbing gear was the piton, which you would, of course, hammer into the face of the rock. And, and soon thereafter, and I, I think this reflects kind of uh, Yvonne's um, environmental ethic, um, he became a proponent of uh, a new movement called kind of clean climbing uh, and replaced the piton with a chalk, which you would instead uh, wedge by hand into the crevices uh, of the rock. And uh, in an early catalog of his, the Schwinnard Equipment Company in 72, um, he ended actually uh, with a statement that I love. It just says, remember the rock, climb clean. And again, this, this shows you kind of infused already with his sense of business was a responsive uh, responsibility uh, towards the natural environment that we all share. Um, now, a number of years later, uh, fast forward to 1998, we put out uh, a pamphlet, not a catalog, a pamphlet called Louder Than Words. It was about 15 pages. And all it was designed to do was really answer the question, as we said, what's a rad seller like us doing on the environmental soapbox? Um, and uh, Patagonia gets a lot of fan mail. I'm sure that uh, Ben and Jerry's and others do as well. But um, one of our pieces of fan mail uh, we put printed on the back of that pamphlet, um, it was actually uh, a scathing letter from an uh, individual in Grants Pass, Oregon, who was angered by Patagonia's uh, support of uh, some forest protection groups um, in Oregon. And basically his message, again, printed on the back of our own pamphlet was um, stay out and stay home and mind your own business. And, and we printed that, I think, in part to remind ourselves and to remind the readers that what he didn't realize was that environmental activism was our business in Patagonia and has been really for nearly 50 years. So for us uh, today, we've got a mission of being in business to save our home planet. The environmental policy and the environmental advocacy um, is really central to everything that we do in all areas of our, our, our enterprise. Some of the ways that, that kind of takes form, uh, perhaps most prominently, is our support of grassroots activists around the country and the world. Um, we helped co-found the 1% for the planet, um, we've got a whole cadre of folks at Patagonia whose sole mission is to uh, financially uh, and otherwise support hundreds, if not thousands, of grassroots groups um, around the country and around the world, in part because we know that, um, that the most passionate people are those grassroots activists on the ground. And, and being able to support them uh, and lift up their voices is really a key way for advocating for our own environmental priorities. Um, but we also uh, kind of uh, have a new, uh, uh, a new thing called Patagonia Works. It's kind of like a dating service uh, to match volunteers with these grassroots groups. So again, trying to make sure that our community, our sport community, our customers and others can find these opportunities, I think, to use their own voices uh, in support of environmental causes. Um, but a couple ways I think that Patagonia in the advocacy space has done a little bit more than, than other companies uh, is we have not kind of been fearful of the courts. And in fact, in the last Trump administration, uh, Patagonia uh, rather famously joined with some local organizations in the Bears Ears to sue the Trump administration 
um, for unlawfully taking uh, over those national monuments and uh, rescinding them uh, or at least shrinking uh, their size. We have filed uh, uh, kind of cases in the Clean Water Act uh, sphere. We have weighed in on the courts and the litigation over the um, the uh, affordable clean energy rule, which was Trump's kind of replacement for the clean power rule. So we've not been afraid to use a variety of tools, again, include, uh, including those legal tools available to us uh, to use the courts. Um, we have also uh, now begun to do selectively political endorsements, not because, again, we're a, a Democrat or Republican partisan, but because I think we're a planetary partisan, right? We express ourselves as to what's good for the planet and we look for our elected representatives to uh, support things that are good for the planet. So a lot of ways that we can leverage our voice and enter the policy space. I guess the last two things that I would say um, is uh, you know, for us uh, as a business, we don't think that we get somehow a pass on the environmental crises that affect us all. You know, you're, you made, Molly, that interesting comment about BP trying to kind of foist uh, the climate crisis uh, onto the shoulders of individuals. And similarly, I think there um, can be a tendency of some companies, I don't think certainly the two represented on this panel, to say, look, we're just a business. Um, you know, these policies, these environmental advocacy opportunities they're great for NGOs, they're great for individuals, but this isn't our fight. And, and we've taken the view, I think from the very beginning, that we have a responsibility as a business to act for uh, positive change in the environmental sphere. And I guess the last point that I'll, that I'll make on this topic is in the scheme of things, um, we're a relatively small company uh, and, and but one voice among many. And so, constantly in the policy sphere or how we leverage our advocacy. One of the things that I and we at Patagonia are looking to do is figure out how we can multiply our voice, whether it's through our business community or our customer base or others. But again, the more we can kind of put an X and a multiplication factor to our policy work and our advocacy work, the more persuasive and successful we'll be. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And like Avi's saying, Patagonia is really a case study in all of the tools that are available to folks to use their platforms to advocate for these bigger causes, um, whether or not that's, like you said, policy, political, legal. There are so many tools available. And I do want to just re you know, uh, give emphasis to this idea of supporting community organizers on the ground, organizing their own communities. That is a fundamental component of environmental justice. And as we think about where the general public is moving, it is steadily in the direction of social and climate justice. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind for companies that are thinking, how does this affect, affect me? It is going to affect and increasingly affect your consumers. Um, so Chris, uh, I wanted to jump over to you now. Um, ben and Jerry's has a unique three-part mission focused equally on product, economic, and social impact, stating that each must thrive equally in a manner that supports communities of which they are a part. I think this is really what systemic change stands for, the express goal of reaching beyond any one individual, entity, or company, and have broader societal impact. So how can companies harness their unique platforms to create structural change? Well, Molly, thank you for the question. And uh, it's great to be with you today. And, and also, Avi, it goes without saying, uh, for all of us at Ben & Jerry's, um, we look to Patagonia and, and are inspired by the work that they do. So it's really wonderful to, to be on the panel with Avi today. Um, you know, I, I think what we've come to realize at uh, Ben & Jerry's is that in many ways, corporations are the most powerful entities within society, that, that corporations hold great sway over the public, over policymakers, and that far too often that power is used to advance the narrow self-interest of corporations and their shareholders. Uh, I, I think, I think, the truth is, you know, I mean, Avi talked about the, the the letter that was printed on the back of, of one of the Patagonia catalogs. You know, we hear all the time, stay out of politics, just sell us ice cream. 
you know, stop preaching about social justice and environmental justice. Just, just give me chunky monkey. The truth is corporations are deeply involved in politics and policies every single day. Most of the time it's behind the scenes, it's out of sight, it's through lobbyists, it's through trade associations. And I think the, 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 you know, what, what we believe to be true is that, that, corporations can use this power and influence, really power and privilege that we have to advance the interests of the common good and not just the sort of corporate narrow self-interest. And we can do that in a way that is transparent uh, uh, to all of our stakeholders, right? You may disagree with our point of view on the idea of reimagining public safety or reducing spending on policing and increasing funding for the kinds of programs and services that can create healthier and safer communities. You may disagree about, but we tell you how we feel. You don't have to dig through lobbying disclosure reports to figure out our point of view on an issue. And so, uh, you know, I, I think what we do sort of at its root, and I think this, this issue of individual change versus sort of systemic change is important, right? We could shut Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's down tomorrow, and our planet is still headed over a cliff, right? That, that ultimately, series of individual actions are in, in, insufficient in addressing some of the major crises uh, that our society and our planet are facing. And so using that power and influence uh, to promote uh, and support the kinds of policies that address the root causes that, that can really attempt to drive systemic change in a way that a series of kind of voluntary sort of individual corporate actions just can't achieve. And I think the, the big opportunity here is that corporations and brands are, you know, I, and you'll hear from my, my friend and colleague, Jay Curley, here in a minute, I, that sit on the social mission and advocacy side, partner with world-class marketers and sale, you know, people that sell stuff like Jay Curley. You, you mentioned in your introduction to me that I, I spent some time working at Greenpeace, and I worked with a bunch of incredibly passionate uh, uh, campaigners and advocates. Um, what we weren't necessarily were trained communications people, and it turns out that the same tools that we use to sell chocolate fudge brownie or fish food can be used to sell ideas, to sell the idea that the climate crisis is an existential threat to our planet, that the criminal justice system is systemically racist and needs to be reformed. And, and I think that's what we've come to understand the, the role of brands and companies can be in advancing progressive social change, using that platform, platform, that privilege to engage, you know, the wider general population on these issues. And I think in, in doing, and you'll hear more about this from Jay, in doing that, we have the ability to both drive impact in the world when we do it well, and when we partner, as, as Avi talked about, partner with on the ground, grassroots, groups and activists that are on the front lines of these issues. And in driving that impact, it also creates a lot of love and warmth for our brand. And so, you know, consumers of Patagonia, consumers of Ben and Jerry's, uh, I predict are sort of loyal, more loyal and more passionate about our brands because of the stands and the work that we do versus companies who don't engage in this kind of um, Yeah, this kind and of I work. think what, what Chris is saying about how you always know where his company stands, I think that's a really powerful thing is that it is not trendy or even acceptable to consumers anymore for companies that sit on the sidelines. People do not like that. And there are a lot of case studies and examples we could throw out even recently of how kind of sitting on the sidelines has ended in true disaster for companies. Um, so anyway, great points. Um, Jay, as a marketer at Ben & Jerry's, a lot of your work centers around harnessing the power of your brand to execute uh, activist campaigns that support the company's values. How has that, how, how has taking a stand impacted your brand and business? Uh, thanks for the question, Molly, and thanks for moderating this panel. Um, I'll just echo what Chris and Avi said, which is it's certainly an honor to be here. And, um, you know, I, I think, thank you, Chris, for teeing that up well for me. 
what we what we aspire to do at Ben and Jerry's is really use our place and culture, our power as a brand in service of the movements we look to support. So quickly on our brand and our business, I, I think it has three primary impacts. The first is actually living up to that three part mission, right? So we have a product mission to try to make the best ice cream in the world, an economic mission to use um, or to give a fair return to our, our stakeholders and shareholders and a social mission, which is actually to use the power of our business to progress our social values, right? So that's different than philanthropy. That's different than charity. Uh, and it really, you know, thanks to the, the, the strategic view of, of Chris and his team, it really is about getting to root causes and really looking to work with the communities that are being marginalized um, to, to have a real impact. So that's the primary thing that we're after in all of our activism and advocacy work and campaigns. Um, and in a good way, you know, we, we will fall short and we do, but we, we also can have an impact and, and be part of bringing movements over tipping points, right? And, and, and the place that we have in culture when leveraged right allows us to do that. I think the other two things that it has more kind of on our brand and our business is, and, and th this isn't what we're after, but they are very, you know, helpful side effects is we're relevant. We are part of an ongoing national and global discussion because we're really looking to service these movements that are growing, that people care about, and that really connect with people. So we're, we are a part of people's lives. So, and then the third bit is because of that, we're actually able to build actual connections with people that may just be about their love for Cherry Garcia or Chunky Monkey, but more often than not, it's much deeper than that. And your love for Chunky Monkey can sometimes be tested when Hagen dazs is two for six at the at the grocery store, you know? But, um, but when you have a deeper connection based on shared values with a company and, and and the company, it's not, we're not just a logo, we're a group of people that really care about this, right? And that's what people connect with. Uh, and that helps us as a business maintain a more loyal uh, connection of, with our fans. Thank you, Jay. And I think, you know, that's such a good point is that consumers respond to it. It's not just doing the right thing. People like hearing this message and they act on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great to see how Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's have shown that. Um, so I'm now going to turn it to the group for a, a group discussion um, and just throw out some questions out there. And again, for folks, feel free to use the Q&A if you have any questions we're not addressing, any loose ends you'd like us to tie up at the end. Um, so the first question, one of the biggest challenges in corporate social action is that companies often see advocacy as politically risky and unrelated to their bottom line. As public opinion has moved swift, swiftly in favor of social and climate action, the calculus for risk has changed. The bigger risk now seems to be not taking action. What are some of the success stories you have in advocating for change and how do you measure that success? Well, maybe, maybe I'll uh, jump in really quickly if I may. I mean, you know, we've got a, a couple of examples where we've been out there on our advocacy. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, quite famously, we put out an ad, I don't know if it was around Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, don't buy this jacket, right? And the whole message was, um, you know, you don't need to keep on spending. And, and um, you know, it was a bit of an anti-consumerism message and, and, and just repair, uh, actually, you know, the kind of the the, the most sustainable piece of clothing you can get is the one that you already own. Uh, and, and we sold a lot of jackets. Um, uh, again, not, not because we asked. In fact, we asked quite the contrary. Um, recently, I think, you know, folks may have seen in the news, um, we had a tag that was sewn uh, inside a bunch of shorts um, that said both the assholes out. Um, and, uh, you know, the baggies, uh, shorts that they were in kind of sold out quite quickly. Um, but in neither instance, for example, 
um, was the environmental message, the environmental advocacy, kind of our policy preference, um, remotely linked, if you will, to either the bottom line or sales figures. And, and for us, and I'm certain this is the same for Ben and Jerry's, um, nobody ever asked me as the environmental advocate um, you know, how does what you're proposing um, or this, you know, this policy that you're seeking to advocate for uh, impact the sale or the likely sale of pants or gear or anything else that we say sell? Um, you know, it's quite the contrary for us. It's how how does everything that we do as a business support the environmental advocacy that I and others at the company want to do? Um, so, you know, measuring success for us has nothing to do with what I would call the usual metrics of, of business success, sales, revenue, uh, and the like. But I also think it's important for those of us, the, the three of us on the call and others here, you know, who are interested in advocating for positive change, you know, how do you measure success? We're in the midst of a climate crisis. We're in the midst of an extinction crisis. Um, we, we still have a lot of environmental injustice out there, uh, even worsened by the kind of COVID pandemic. So, you know, depending on how you look at it, there's a lot of stuff not going very well at the moment. Yet we have constantly tried to innovate and be creative and be forceful um, in our advocacy. So, you know, for me, it's, it's not like we can measure our success necessarily by the immediate uh, reversal of these trends, though I think that would be great to, to do. But for us, I think success uh, is in, in part effort. It's, it's how creative we are. It's how we're able to, again, get our message out. And, and, and as I said earlier, uh, multiply the voices. It's how we're able to support others. So it's, it's, you know, it's a long way of saying it's very easy to measure success if you're looking inward at a lot of kind of business-related metrics. But when it comes to these systemic issues, um, you know, whether it's uh, criminal justice, racial uh, justice, environmental issues, yeah, this is a long game that we're all playing. And I think um, you know, we need to be very careful about uh, kind of keeping score lest we, uh, I think, get dissuaded from you know, the, the aggressive strategies that we need to pursue. Yeah, and maybe I just briefly build and then, you know, Jay, you can follow up. Um, you know, I think this is a question that we probably get asked of us as much as any other question, right? How do you measure success? And I think, you know, it is, it, it's not easy is the quick answer, right? Like, you know, we all work in companies that are run day to day by a key set, set of business metrics that tell you if you're winning or losing, right? We, we literally get daily emails at Ben and Jerry's that tells us how our financial performance is, is doing versus, you know, our, our budget for the month and the quarter and the year. And we're tracking the price of butter and we, we can instantly look at a dashboard of metrics and see whether we're winning or losing as a business. Around the advocacy work that we do, it it's it's not as easy, right? There 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 isn't a a dashboard you can look at to see are we making progress in the right direction against the climate crisis or not. And and so I think working in the context of an organization that wants to know whether we're winning or losing, um, it is it is it consternates some of our colleagues who I think are so used to that. What I would say, what I think is important as it relates to this kind of work is we, we measure our impact and our success through wins. So I'll give you a quick couple of examples. Um, recently, we were working in the city of St. Louis as part of our national criminal justice reform work uh, with a group of activists and campaigners who were looking to close a particularly horrible prison in the city of St. Louis. The city of St. Louis is about 50% black. Uh, the workhouse uh, prison in the city, the jail, uh, was almost as 96, 97% black inmates. And almost everyone in that prison was being held pre-trial. So strictly for uh, lack of cash bail. They were essentially locked up, not because they had been convicted of a crime, but because they were poor. It, it's sort of a perfect example of everything that's wrong with our criminal justice system. 
we spent about two and a half years working uh, and sort of following the lead of the activists and campaigners on the ground in that campaign. It was ultimately successful. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the, the first year that we were working on this work, again, we, we know how the company did, but we had put a year's worth of work into, into supporting the coalition and we hadn't, the prison wasn't closed. And so, you know, we had, you know, engagement numbers and reach numbers around the number of folks that we, you know, got to take action and the number of folks that, you know, saw posts that we put together. But ultimately, what matters is whether we're making progress on the policies that address the kind of root causes. And so often you're sort of losing, 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 losing until you win. And I think part of measuring the success on that path to winning the kinds of policies that drive systemic change is that, that you're building power as you do the work. And I think that's what, you know, Patagonia does so incredibly well by providing capacity to grassroots groups who are on the ground waging this the, these fights. And what we try and do by, by acting as sort of a, an on-ramp or a conduit for our fans, our consumers, to become, as Jay talked about earlier, part of these larger movements, right? We want to help our, our mainstream audience become supporters of the partners that we're working with. And so, so in the process of, of what are hopefully incremental wins on policy, we're also hopefully helping build power in the movements and with the groups that we're working with. Yeah, I, I just put like the, a fine point on that, Chris. You, you, well, you obviously said it yell well because it's it's the theory of change that you lead us at Ben and Jerry's through. It, it is we we lose until we win, but in doing that, we're building, we're helping to build movements, we're helping to grow movements, and as as a marketer who does have lots of dashboards, um, we can put proxy metrics together around are we actually growing this movement or not? Are we exposing more people to it? Are we bringing more people in? Are we able to engage those people that we're bringing in to go out and take action? Um, and so that's that's really how we build um, the execution side of the activism and advocacy campaigns. And, and the fun part about it is like Chris was saying before, we use all the tools and practices that we would to to sell Chunky Monkey to close the workhouse, you know, put up billboards, put in, you know, ads targeting the mayor in St. Louis, wrapped an ice cream truck uh, in, in graphics and drove around and met with communities and gave out ice cream. It's a lot easier to um, bring people together when you're giving them free ice cream. And, 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 and in all seriousness, that can be a really powerful organizing tool. Um, and so that's, that's, what we've done, and and that is what happened. We lost budget cycle after budget cycle after budget cycle until we won, right? And you know, as we speak now, the the workhouse jail in St. Louis is being closed. So um, you know, it it, it, it works, uh, and it can be have a real impact not just on the community of St. Louis, but as an example of of how this work can can happen throughout the country. Yeah, and if I and if I can just add, Molly, I, I I think one of the things embedded maybe in your question, I don't know intentionally or not, is um, you know whether we we or anybody uh, that does this advocacy work can really take credit for a win, um, much loss, much less uh, a loss. And so, for example, I, I think a year or so ago, Equinor, the big Norwegian uh, oil and gas company, decided to abandon plans to drill for oil uh, in the great Australian Bight, um, you know, beautiful marine park out there. Patagonia had long kind of uh, supported the movement to preserve that area and get, um, get Equinor out. Um, yeah, great, big success. Um, you know, was it us? Frankly, it doesn't matter. I think we were on the right side of that issue with a lot of people. Uh, and so we can celebrate without kind of, you know, the issue was a success, whether, um, you know, we had a role in it or not, I think, probably important to figure out because we all want to invest our resources and make a difference. Um, but I'm not so sure that kind of keeping score in the normal sense uh, is the way to go about it. Currently, for example, um, you know, some of the Patagonia uh, views, if you will, like where we are going to advocate, 
uh, is to protect the Tongass, uh, you know, uh, forest up in Alaska, to prevent drilling in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, is issues like that, big issues. Um, you know, if, if we are successful, if I should say, um, you know, we all are successful in getting these protections, getting the Biden administration to weigh in, et cetera, I'm less concerned, you know, whether we can kind of tally those of us that, that do a lot of the environmental policy and advocacy work, you know, what was our role and more interested in knowing that we were, again, on the right side of an important issue uh, and we, we kind of continued. We, it, this was not a fleeting in and out uh, kind of advocacy that we were there uh, all along um, and along the way. And so for me, you know, less about, again, uh, scorekeeping, more uh, about the durability uh, of, of our, you know, of our being in this fight, if you will. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's getting at the heart of what we're talking about today. It's like what Jay is saying, that this is a long game and you lose until you win. The whole premise of systemic change, right, is that one individual combined with a lot of individuals, companies, everybody with a platform advocating for some larger social movement that impacts everybody. The whole idea, right, is that it's all of us trying to impact everybody. Um, so I think that's a really good point you have. Um, it's all part of this broader movement for social justice and climate justice is part of that. Criminal justice is a part of that. Um, so I would love to get to the next question. Um, a lot of companies and organizations may be interested in doing what Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's have successfully done, activating their consumer base, coming out in, spe in support of specific social issues, taking a real stance, but they often don't know where to start. What next steps would you recommend for other companies that are trying to develop an advocacy strategy? I think one thing that I would say, and I'm probably in a unique position on this panel to say it, is um, most companies have a me. They have someone who does marketing. <laughs> um, and not a lot of companies have the expertise and experience of people like Avi and people like Chris, right? So. Um, there is a tendency for organizations when they want to do this that um, they can figure it out or they can hire an agency that help them do this and you know sitting in a conference room figuring out what their you know campaign should look like and at ben and jerry's that's the not the approach we take at all it's really about listening to the organizations and the movements we're looking to support and building our strategies around that but even that it's not the marketer who does that. It's the trained activists and organizers on our team that really lead that work. Um, now, does that mean you have to go hire a huge team to do that? Um, you know, depending on your the size of your company, probably not. But um, the idea that you can kind of just sit in a conference room and come up with a campaign um, is not the right approach, <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, so uh, whether it's bringing people in who are the activists, the advocates, the organizers, or at the very least, really speaking to those people and seeing how your business uh, and your operations can be of service to them uh, is a much better starting point. Yeah, I, I think, Jay, what you just said uh, is spot on, which is to say, um, uh, you know, Patagonia has got a big, a big mouthful of a mission, right? In business to save the home planet. That's, there's a lot of stuff that's wrapped up in there. Ben and Jerry's does stuff uh, even well beyond, you know, what, what we would kind of typically think is the environmental sphere. And they go into, you know, an array of uh, social and economic justice issues. So a, a lot going on there. But, but in every community where every business is, there is an issue of local import. Uh, and there are people organized on one side or the other of that issue, you know, whether, again, it's a living wage, whether it's a local uh, environmental uh, issue, uh, whether it's LGBT, you know, Q rights issues in that community or, or uh, access to a good education for everybody. There's something going on where your business is located, where your employees are and where your customers are. And you can start very small. And again, not even, as Jay said, with your own voice, but lend your support to um, an already existent group, um, you know, that, that is doing that work with passion um, and integrity in the community. Patagonia works with grantees, you know, all over the country. And if you look at our social media feed, for example, 
a lot of what we put out there is simply to amplify and hopefully be in support of the voice of these local groups who don't have the you know x number of followers that patagonia does um, and many companies again can start by supporting the voice of others rather than coming up with their kind of you know own business voice uh, but the other thing too just to keep in mind is uh, and I, I touched on this a little bit earlier um, the the premise of of this is kind of what can businesses do and we need to realize that um, there are always going to be, sadly to say, businesses uh, in any sector who are going to be opposed to um, you know, social change, to environmental progress, et cetera, because of their view, I think quite wrongly uh, and, and, and uh, uh, in myopic, that there's a cost associated with this and they don't wanna pay for this. Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's and other companies you know, like us are actually demonstrating in the larger sense of things that, you know, it's, it, that business can be for strong environmental standards. Business can be and should be for strong social justice you know, uh, kind of movements, et cetera. And simply saying anything as a business already begins to separate you out from the pack and I think is really a, a step in a positive direction. And just real quick, Molly, the one thing I would add to, to the smart things both Jay and Avi said is <clears throat> I think it's important that whatever it is you do, that you root it in something that's real. So I think you heard Avi talk about Yvonne's love of climbing and the, the, the sort of the piece of climbing hardware that he realized was sort of trashing the trashing the rocks and you know you you can again you can agree or disagree with the positions that we take at ben and jerry's we have two very passionate progressive co-founders that set this business on a course uh, uh to be focused around a, a set of progressive values and so in order to do this in a way that's both credible and authentic you need not find an issue or a cause that people don't disagree with because if you're going to take a stand on any issue, there are going to be people that agree with you or disagree with you. What you don't want to be accused of and what you don't want to have happen, honestly, is for people to suggest that you're kind of surfing a fashionable issue to sell more jackets or ice cream, right? You can say a lot of things about Ben and Jerry's, but, you know, coming out early in support of the Black Lives Matter movement or, you know, fighting for climate justice or our, our you know, most recent decision to, to reorient our operations in the occupied Palestinian territories are, are rooted in our own values, things we believe in the world. And so you can disagree with us, but it's hard to say that we're doing it strictly to surf a, a, a fashionable cause or to sell more ice cream. And I think that's the most important point. Every company or brand has a story, has a founder, has, you know, is, is a group of people. And, and the companies that do this best are the ones who root what they do in something they believe, not in an attempt to appropriate a cause or a belief that they believe their consumers or others have. Yeah, I think I think you, Chris, has such a good point. It's like this idea of stay, say what you stand for, and people will follow. Um, as long as people know what you stand for, and there is no question that folks know what Ben and Jerry stand for, it goes a long way. And going back to what Avi was saying earlier too about ultimately, it doesn't matter who gets credit, right? This is about this greater cause. It reminds me of this quote that uh, by Martin Luther King Jr. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That's this idea that we're on this path and, and we are solidly moving in a more progressive way, but it takes action from all of us collectively. Um, and so I think that's a really important part of this conversation. Um, so I'd love to go to a Q&A question. We have a great question from Mary. And again, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A. We'll try to get to them. Um, Mary asks, what recommendations do you have for a small startup with a small voice that wants to make sure they are doing all they can to have an impact? And I love, I think this is a really important question because we know we have large corporations here and also small startups and small businesses. So I think, thank you so much, Mary, for asking this. So I, th I think the first question, Mary, is uh, to have an impact on what? 
Uh, and I say that because, you know, we've, we, there's a, there are an array of issues out there um, that are important to us on this panel that, that may or may not be important to you or your business. And again, I, I think um, you have to start from a position of authenticity um, and, and having that connection. So really for me, uh, the, the first thing is to identify that issue or those issues that, um, that resonate with you uh, as an individual, that resonate with you as a small business, that may be important you know, in the communities in which you operate, uh, and then you know, begin from there. Um, I, I will add as well that, that we've got a decent staff at Patagonia. Uh, Chris and Jay and their teams are fantastic at, at uh, Ben and Jerry's, but I recognize that not every company of course, has the wherewithal to, um, to hire folks, um, you know, to do this sort of work uh, to the extent it, it's, it's kind of different from, uh, if you will, the profit making portion of, of your business. But don't be afraid to kind of partner with other uh, companies to, to find, um, you know, soulmates, if you will, uh, whether they're your competitors or others. Um, this journey is meant, in my judgment, to be a shared journey. Uh, by like-minded uh, businesses uh, and groups and individuals. Uh, Patagonia, for example, we belong to a, a range of, um, I'll, I'll kind of call them, uh, for lack of a better term, sustainable company organizations or coalitions. Um, we learn from them all the time. We try to contribute uh, there and, and add our voice to theirs. Um, there's the B, the B Corp movement, if you will. Um, you know, we're, we're, I think both of us are, are benefit corporations. That's a terrific community, again, uh, to be part of a larger movement, um, you know, kind of showing that stakeholders are not simply uh, what you can return to a shareholder, but how you treat your employees and, uh, and the environment and others. So uh, I, I think, you know, start small uh, and, and find friends along the way. Just quickly, you, you mentioned in, in my intro, Molly, my role at Vermont Business is for social responsibility, and Avi, Avi talked about this. In states all around the country, there are, there are corporate social responsibility sort of business associations. I'd encourage, you know, to, to Avi's point, they don't have the resources to do what we do at Ben & Jerry's at Patagonia, but, but you know, these, these state-based um, sort of social responsibility business uh, associations do have staff and and can help bring together smaller businesses to to um, to work on kind of collective action. The the American Sustainable Business Council, another a national organization, but another organization where uh, smaller and medium sized companies can plug in uh, and and get more engaged on kind of policy and advocacy stuff. So it's a great way to sort of take some some um, initial steps as a as a smaller company. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's spot on. If you can't bring the experts in, find them and figure out how to engage with them. And, and a, a huge component of that is joining organizations where they have experts working on this full time and can provide you with those resources. I can guarantee those organizations want your voice and want your help and want your membership. Another thing I would just note really fast is that um, there are opportunities to work with your trade associations. A lot of small businesses don't have the funds to hire a full-time lobbyist that can advocate for social action um, or an environmental justice focused person or a chief sustainability officer. Um, but I guarantee there are folks lobbying for things that are specific to your industry. It's important that these organizations can take on climate action or social justice. They should be out there lobbying for the federal clean energy standard. That's important for what you do. Um, so know that those resources are available as well. Um, okay, there's a, so a lot of questions, sorry. Okay. Um, this one is from Julian. Julian, thank you so much for this question. How can small businesses incorporate the sustainable and social impact work they do into their marketing without sounding preachy or self-serving? So Jay, this might be right up your alley. Yeah, sure. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I, I mean, I, at least for me, there's there's two ways to think about that. I think the first is something I said earlier, and, and, and Avi, I think you, you said it better than I did. Um, if it if you're bragging about yourself, you may be preachy and self-serving, right? 
if you are raising up the organizations and the movements you're looking to support, then you're using your power to shine a light on, on the folks you're looking to support. So I think practically that's, that's an important bit. Um, the other thing, and this is a little bit more, I guess, of my own philosophy on marketing communications, but I'm a believer that powerful brands are dynamic, they're multi-layered, they're evolving, just like humans and other organizations are. Um, and so this kind of old school idea of like a single-minded proposition, I think is really antiquated and I, I don't think works at all. So the idea that a company can, um, you know, talk about chunks and swirls in their ice cream one day and closing the workhouse the next and putting a price on the carbon the next and a chunky monkey milkshake the next day. I think that's real. And I think that's the way we connect with people in the long term. What we don't do though, and I certainly don't recommend, is a campaign about chunks and swirls and milkshakes that helps to close the workhouse and put a price on carbon, right? So <laughs> each one of our pieces of communications and campaigns do wanna be singular. And we wanna be able to be clear about what we're looking to do. But almost all organizations can walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, like June doesn't have to be milkshake month and then July can be criminal justice reform month. You can do multiple things at multiple times. Um, and so, yeah, that that that's how I would look at it or how we do try to look at it. Great, thank you so much. Let's talk about you know about using your platform to advocate for something larger. Um, okay, William has a really good question, also for startups, which I think is really good that these smaller companies are are talking about what they can do because it is coming from a different place. Um, for a startup, how do you balance financial success with time and money dedicated to a cause? Maybe I just take a quick whack at this and then let the others jump in. I, I think the trick here is to not see those two things as a contradiction, right? It's not, I, I need to spend time over here doing my business and growing the business and I need to spend time over here doing philanthropy or social good. The trick is, I think even for a startup, how do you, you know, what is the product or service that that your your company offers the world and how do you use that in the day-to-day -day operations of your company to make the world a little bit better place, right? And I think, so when you do that, your, your values and the work that you're doing, you know, to support groups in your community or whatever, become a, a, a strategic lever of growth for your business, not a, not a distraction. And I think, again, the companies that do this best are the companies that understand that and don't see it as, well, if I spend a dollar over here doing X, I, it's one less dollar I have to be selling ice cream, right? And I think that that's the trick here is to figure out how to make it a part of your company and its, its place in the world. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes. So I apologize to everybody. We won't be able to get to all of these questions, but we have a really good question that I do want to throw out there because I think it's it's really important, kind of hands-on next steps. Um, anonymous, uh, how how campaign consent? How is campaign consensus decided on activist teams? Are their team members dis, are the team members diverse politically, and is there pressure to match trending views? I mean, I think from a Ben and Jerry's perspective, there is, um, from a partisan perspective, th that's not the discussion. The discussion is what are our company values that are clear? What is the strategic direction of the activism work? Uh, and then how can all the team members work in service of that? Um, you know, we, we are political not because we are uh, and we aren't partisan. We're not choosing candidates or picking one party over another. 
but as we've talked about, if you're going to engage in uh, the fight for climate justice, that happens in the political arena. So you need to engage there. Um, and so we are political, but we're we're not partisan. And that's not part of like a screen or or how we think about building teams. Those teams are are built and work in service of a strategy. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add, I guess, from from Patagonia's side as well. Um, you know, I I I don't ask, uh, nor do I know, for that matter, kind of um, you know who my colleagues voted for, what their political party is. Um, what I what is important to me, and what is important to the company, um, is you know what are our positions again, as Jay and Chris have said, on climate justice issues. Um, what is our uh, position as a company going to be on clean water issues? And a lot of these issues, as we've just heard, you know, they matriculate, if you will, through a political process. So we're going to have uh, a really keen eye, for example, on this administration's work on uh, the clean water uh, jurisdictional rulemakings, right? Because we've got a sense of where things ought to be in terms of uh, protecting our waters and ensuring clean water um, for all Americans. And, and whether you call it a political uh, process or not, that's where we're investing our energies, not again on a Republican or a Democratic uh, a plan. The, at the end of the question, though, is there pressure to match kind of trending views? Uh, I don't feel it, at least within Patagonia whatsoever. I, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I suppose we're all, you know, we all read up in the papers. We kind of know where, um, you know, where one group uh, says we ought to go or another. But those are not conversations that, that we have. Again, for us, uh, it uh, starts with the mission to save the home planet. Um, we look at uh, you know, who we can support, what the array of, of tools we have and resources we have um, uh, available to us to, I think, make uh, a positive difference uh, in that. And, you know, trends, uh, trends will uh, wax and wane uh, sometimes, you know, over the course of weeks, sometimes over the course of months. But for me, I think, um, you know, kind of being steady, grounded again in the mission and a long term strategy is what we're all about. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point is that, you know, it is political and policy based because policy and politics is one of the ways you can affect social change. And we're talking about social change and, and systemic change. Policy is that. But ultimately, I think everybody on this panel, we can all agree that we don't care if you're a Democrat or a, a Republican, if you're in support of social justice. That is that transcends politics. It becomes something much bigger about human rights and broader society. Um, so I think that's a really good question about kind of discerning those both and how to message that. Um, so we are out of time. I just want to give the panelists an opportunity to add anything else that we've been missing, um, make any final points about what you're doing or what you'd encourage other companies to do. The last thing I would want to add, first of all, thank you all. Um, it, it is, as Chris started out with, it really is always a pleasure to chat with my friends and colleagues at Ben and & Jerry's and, and learn from them and kind of watch what they're doing. And Molly, thank you for bringing us together on this. Um, I, I remember when I was hired as the environmental advocate at Patagonia, you know, two and a half years ago, it was a new position there. And, you know, my thought was, well, this sounds a bit one of a kind or somewhat unique. Um, but my goal, and I think, you know, we all share this goal is, is to make our work um, not stand out, but really run of the mill, right? This, this is the kind of thing we think all businesses in our society ought to be invested in. Um, and, and as we've said in bits and uh, you know, parts of this conversation, you don't need to jump in and match what I'm doing or what you know, Chris and Jay and their company are doing. Find your space, find your voice, uh, start you know, at the scale that's comfortable to you. But I hope that folks uh, at, at varying stages of their business careers are encouraged to, again, uh, lend their voices to the, the causes that are important to them. Yeah, thanks, Avi. I, I would just, you know, echo that first. Molly, thank you. Uh, fantastic job here. Um, and, you know, we as Ben and Jerry's as Patagonia can disappear from the earth tomorrow and, you know, 
there'll be minimal impact on on a lot except you know some people might be a little wetter out on a hike um because they don't have the right jacket and people will miss uh miss their ice cream a little bit um i think if there's anything that we've done right collectively over the years it's been trying to show the role that business can play not in a self-serving way but hopefully as as a way to to show show others that, that they can do this too and you know i think the the growth and the impact the two companies have uh have had shows that this is very doable uh and in a good way you know or a bad way you know we, we've made mistakes too and folks can learn from that uh, as we try to um through the years but we, we need people to join us um and in a good way more and more people are and more and more people are waking up to the need for businesses to play a big role in these you know big systemic change that we need and and to be blunt otherwise we are fucked and i will just say thank you molly great to be on the panel and look i mean I, you know we often hear all the time, well, you guys can do that because you're Ben and Jerry's, right? And and ultimately, at the end of the day, if an ice cream company based in Burlington, Vermont can be, you know, advocates for criminal justice reform and be working in communities like the city of St. Louis to close a horrendous prison, frankly, any company can do anything. And really, we're able to do these things not because we're Ben and Jerry's, but because we decided that we were gonna do it. And I think that's something any company and brand can and should do. And I love that Chris just said that anybody, any company can do this. Um, I think the space is wide open and companies like Patagonia and Ben and & Jerry's and all of these business organizations will welcome you in um, to being an advocate. It's about using that platform. And I know a lot of folks in this, in this panel and may be able to relate to the fact that like, we've all tried to talk to founders and CEOs and kind of make the case for advocacy and you can get a lot of pushback. And what I have found is that kind of the common denominator when you get that pushback is just an emotion of fear. And I believe that fear, and I think everybody on this call can agree, fear has no place in the social justice movement because we know what we can achieve, we've seen it, and we are continuing to push forward. So it's a matter of just refocusing on what's possible because we can do so much together. So I am so grateful to all of our panelists, Jay, Avi, Chris, and Ben and & Jerry's and Patagonia, and all of you for joining this panel to talk about this. If you have questions, feel free to follow up with us, um, but we really thank you for being here and for taking a passion and interest in what we're trying to do. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>